pictures and come back and have those pictures on my wall printed in uh, that evening, which is just fabulous. So that in my addiction to the outdoors and to birds of prey, um, that's my background. So I'm going to go through just some real basic stuff. My website's here. Um, we're talking about photography and we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to kind of run through a lot of this stuff, but um, we'll have questions afterwards. And uh, so let's just start. I'm going to talk about cameras first, little techniques, and then just the art of photography, which is my passion. So the big question everybody has is, well, at least for me, I'd have to ask you is, what are you trying to take a picture of? Are you up close? Or is the birds far away? Do you want flight photos? Do you want owls in the trees? You really have to think about that because that is going to affect your choice for cameras and how you do things. If you want a simple portrait, as you see here, um, any camera will do. I mean, the iPhones today are just fabulous. But as most people seem to want, they want the flight photo, they want that type of image you're going to need some type of telephoto lens. And there's all kinds of them, all different lengths and shapes. I'll show you some here in a little bit. Um, things to think about when you're choosing camera. They have all these megapixels now, 10 megapixel, 20 megapixel, 50 megapixel. It just goes on and on. Um, that's really nice. It gives you high resolution. It's great for cropping. Um, but there's issues with that. Um, the cameras also have internal computers, how they process the images. Some are better than others. Some of them let you take high-speed photos. Some of them are not so fast. And then noise or grain, which you'll see in some of your images. Um, all these cameras are good and bad for all these different features. And, and obviously, if you spend more, you can get more of the high-end features, but it comes at cost. And uh, is that something you want to, are you really that serious about what you're doing? And if you are, then you have to research this a little more. We'll talk some more about it coming up. Um, but as a photographer doing Raptor photography, you, you got to, the camera, you just have to have that camera down as far as how it works. Forget you, you have to be able to pick it up and know exactly what you're doing. There's no downtime for scratching your head saying, oh gosh, I mean, we all do at some point, but for me, I grab the camera and I set up, I check the lighting, I check the shutter speed, what am I trying to photograph? And uh, so when I pick up that camera and tap that button, it's ready to roll. So we got to talk about f-stops, depth of field, shutter speed, ISOs, these are all things that need to be on your mind. And again, it's technical. You may know all this already, but we're going to go through it real quick. Um, F-stops, you read about a lens. It's a fast lens. It's got a big F-stop, actually big F-stop, but it would be a low number, as you see here. And you can see how 2.8 is huge, F8 smaller, F22. And what happens is the, the smaller that aperture, say 2.8, your depth of field, which is the point of what's in focus, the area that's in focus, what you photograph is going to be very small, where if you go to F22, your uh, depth of field is going to be wider. And I'll show you with some examples. So here's some tomatoes in my backyard last summer. Um, you can see at F2.8, no depth of field. And when I say depth of field, the tomatoes are in focus, but look at the background out of focus. And then if I go to F22, I get a lot more in focus. So as again, as your F-stop increases, your depth of field increases. So why do I care about that? Well, if I'm doing, say, these peregrine falcons, youngsters on the cliff, you can see if I focus on the front falcon on the left, the back one's a little fuzzy. And if I go to the front bird on the right, you can see how the bird's a little out of focus, but I increase the f-stop to get that a little more depth of field. Again, in flight can bother you as well, where I focused on the back bird and with a what we would call a small or a low f-stop, that 7.1, the bird in the front is not in focus. And these can be really hard, no matter what you're doing to get both in focus. And you hope they're on the same plane, but you see what I'm talking about, depth of field, 
because it's something to think about if you're photographing birds um, and you want as many of them in focus as you can, say, for instance, in flight. Um, shutter speed, you have to work with shutter speed because do you want to freeze that bird in flight? And if I'm doing flight photography, uh, I like 2,500 of a second or faster if I can get it. Um, if you go less than that, you can if the bird's flying slow, but if it's flying fast, um, you may get a little blur. And sometimes that's preferable if you can get the bird's eye in focus, but then again, maybe not. Uh, for static subjects sitting on a branch, on a fence post, in a tree, you can go much lower, but play around with their shutter speeds. Uh, if you have a bird that's sitting, shoot it at a higher speed and then come down in your shutter speed. Because again, if you lower the shutter speed, um, you may be able to lower your ISO, which is the next subject, um, because that will give you possibly less noise or less grain. Um, shutter speed, when you're doing birds in flight, uh, I use a long lens a lot of the time, big telephoto lenses, and um, I handhold them most of the time. I don't put them on a tripod, and a lot of folks do, but they can be heavy, and you can't always hold them long but they restrict the motion, the movement of me following a bird around. So, and again, that higher shutter speed will help me reduce some of the bumps and blurs that I might get. The new lenses have image stabilization, vibration reduction, steady shot. There's all these different names and they do help. But when you're using high shutter speed, if you're doing flight photography, they really, it doesn't really help you that much. Um, so again, showing you some shots here, 5,000 of a second at a 6.3 f-stop. I get the bird, the falcon in focus, but you see the depth of field, there's just not enough there to capture the starlings behind. Um, so if I increase the f-stop a little bit, I can get more of this red tail hawk in focus from one wing to the other wing, which, uh, you know, which you'd like sometimes or most of the time, can you get them all in there? Now, these birds were on the same focal plane, meaning they were next to each other or above. One was above the other, so my depth of field probably isn't as critical, so I can get them both in focus. I need that shutter speed to freeze the action, so in this case, I kind of got bonus where I got both. I got good depth of field and shutter speed to capture this. Um, so if you lower your f-stop, meaning you go down to a smaller aperture, which lets more light in, and you remember that, uh, that slide that had the wide aperture at 2.8, it lets more light in so I can get a higher shutter speed. And that's really nice, it helps quite a bit, but there's sometimes when you just don't have that light, you can't lower the, the f-stop, and if you do, your shutter speed drops. So what you can do is adjust the ISO setting on your camera and you can move that up, which will let you increase your f-stop. It could let you increase your shutter speed, but it may increase the noise that you get or grain that your image shows up. And that's just the nature of physics of cameras and things like that. But it's something you need to know, you need to play around with, uh, work with that, uh, change your ISO, especially if you have a bird perched uh, so slow the shutter speed down, change your aperture, change your ISO setting, play around with that and see if there's a sweet spot for you and the gear that you're using. And it comes with just practice. So we have all these things to think about. Camera settings, do I go automatic? Do I shutter priority, aperture priority? Do I just go full manual, auto ISO, auto focus? You can customize your camera. Um, these are all subjects that I could spend, you know, minutes, day, you know, hours on each one. And, and you have to think about these. And I bring this all up just for your thoughts. You know, think about these things. Do you want to shoot all automatic? Do you need to shoot shutter priority? Do you want to go aperture priority? For me, I shoot manual probably 99% of the time. I, you know, use these cameras long enough over the years where I'm comfortable with how they react to light. And when I can look through that viewfinder, I can get an impression. I, I can kind of see it. 
if you use anything automatic, sometimes you're at the disposal of the camera and, you know, and it's the way it sees things and it may not be the way you want the image to come out. The one thing I do use automatic a lot, most of the time is autofocus. But that said, I do have a button on the back of the camera where I can push it and turn it off or turn it on because there are times when I don't want the camera lens to hunt, which they will do in autofocus, especially when you have image like this one in the background where the water in the background is, is twinkling and it can throw the camera off. So you have to be careful. So again, play with all these things read about it, see what works for you. Again, my feeling is, and, and we're, I talk more about flight photography because that's what I like. And it seems to be a big issue or a big, uh, everybody seems to like those flight photos. Think about shooting in a manual mode. There's all kinds of cameras. I mean, just goes on and on and on. You know, DSLRs, mirrorless cameras, point and shoots. You can shoot an old film cam camera. Um, the DSLRs are like your old regular cameras, interchangeable lens cameras, digital single lens reflex, where there's a mirror inside and it flips up when you take the picture and flips down when you're looking through the lens. And that is really nice, especially because you're looking without any kind of obstruction or electronic imaging with what we would call a mirrorless camera, which are becoming very popular today. You're seeing a cleaner, clearer picture, which I prefer most of the time. But again, as technology is getting better and better now, these mirrorless cameras, which don't have a mirror that flips up and down, but when you look through that viewfinder, you're seeing pretty much the exact image that you're gonna get when you hit the shutter button. And what's great about that is you can adjust your settings and see how that image changes, whether, you know, some light, sometimes you wanna add light. Sometimes you're unexposed, sometimes you're overexposed. So those are, I, I mean, I'm, I've gone completely mirrorless these days just for that reason. Um, and the fact that they're silent because we do birds of prey, they can hear your shutter with these DSLR, the older ones, they can hear the shutter go up and down. And I got to tell you, they will look your way. And for me, I don't want them looking at me at all. I would like to be invisible out there. So there are, and again, these DSLR and mirrorless cameras, well, the DSLR have interchangeable lenses and many of the mirrorless cameras have uh, interchangeable lenses, but there are also a lot of what we call point and shoot cameras that have mirrorless capability and have some pretty phenomenal uh, lenses that are built into them, which we'll talk about in just a moment here. Um, if you shoot film, that's great, but there are limitations with getting your film developed and the digital sensors are so good these days. So, I mean, film is kind of becoming a dinosaur or is a dinosaur. Um, just to cloud the issue some more, there are full frame cameras and there are crop sensor cameras. Full frame takes advantage of the entire frame where these other cameras, APS-C or a crop sensor camera, are popular as well. They are DSLR or mirrorless cameras. And I use full frame cameras because I want as much of that information coming through from the sensor. But the APS-C crop sensors will give you as a Raptor photographer more range. It will bring things closer to you, which actually is like adding a longer telephoto lens to your camera. And so I would recommend that you read about these because they can be really they really help a lot, again, doing birds of prey, because it seems like we never get close enough, even with the biggest lenses we have. So read about that and, and study those, because it may be a camera choice for you. Um, megapixels, we all think more is better. Sometimes, most of the time, that's true, but there are cameras that maybe don't have a quality megapixel or, or something about them. And do you really need this high megapixel? I have a good friend who uses Olympus cameras and they're not the highest megapixel, but they're very light. The lenses are light. They give you a lot of freedom and movement and you know less weight on your back if you're carrying. So you, know, you can read about megapixel count and things like that. I like the higher ones personally because I can crop the image. And as I said before, you never can get close enough sometimes. So if I can crop, that's just great. 
Um, and that's where that higher megapixel count comes from, but it also comes at a higher cost as far as camera cost. Um, fixed zooms, fixed lenses versus zoom lenses. I love zoom lenses, but I also have long telephoto lenses. And, you know, I use them both depending on the situation. Uh, Sony makes a 200 to 600 lens right now that fits on their mirrorless cameras, which is my bread and butter lens. I just absolutely love it because I can zoom out to find the bird and then I can zoom in once I get it and, you know, get it in the viewfinder. Um, there are lens extenders, which are great to add between your lens and the camera body, which will give you a little more reach, a little more telephoto power, which can be a nice thing. Um, so again, rent or buy, you can buy cameras. They're very expensive, some of them, but you can also rent them. And I've rented them many times to, you know, try them out. Do I want to spend this money? Do I want to get my credit card maxed out on this gear? Um, cause you know, they're expensive and will they work the way I want them to work? So you can rent them. Um, the rental houses I like, I like lensrentals.com the best. Um, but borrowlenses.com is probably just as good. And they're here in the States and really easy to deal with. They'll ship the camera, the gear right to your house. When you're done using it, you put the tag back on the FedEx label and just take it to FedEx, drop off, and it's gone. It makes it so easy and you get to try it out at a lot less and, and at a lot less money spent. And if you really like it, they even have now where you can rent and then also buy it. So if you like it that much when you have it, hey, keep it and just send us a check. Hey, that's great. Um, for used cameras, there's a great market for used cameras. And the, and the one website that I like the best is fredmiranda.com. And um, fabulous. Camera Lens and Reviews, dpreview.com, fredmiranda.com, and then B&H Photo. Go and read the reviews about these cameras. So um, you'll learn a lot. Um, DSLR, mirrorless choices. And what I can do is I can provide some of these sheets, these pages for you so you can read my comments because I picked, you know, a handful of cameras that I like and I gave you the setup that I use right now. Um, and if you have questions afterwards, so you're looking at the screen here now. <clears throat> And this is by far not the whole list. There are so many manufacturers now and, and there's other lenses. I tend to use the name, you know, like a Canon lens, I'll use a Canon or a Canon camera, I'll use a Canon lens, but Sigma makes great lenses. Tokina it just goes on and on now. And they're, again, read the reviews about lenses at those websites I mentioned, and you can learn quite a bit what would work for you. Again, lens choices, I'll make this available to you different lenses that you, you know, could consider. And again, I'm thinking Raptor photography. So most of these lenses are longer lenses, telephoto lenses, uh, zoom lenses, because again, we never can get close enough. So we, we want that flexibility. So there's my list. Um, field techniques. I mean, we, I've talked about cameras and, and that's all great. And I mean, you have to have cameras have to be second nature the way you use them. It's a tool in your toolbox. You have to be able to pull it out and know exactly what it does, how it does things. And again, second nature, because you have to be ready to go. And we know with birds of prey, they never sit still for very long. They're always moving, the head's turning, they're flying, there's, you know, this and that. Um, so again, you got to have that camera just absolutely ready to go. But then the biggest part for me at least is understand the biology and nature of the birds you want to photograph. I mean, spend, you have to spend the time or here's what I do. I just spend a lot of time in the field and I try to anticipate their behavior. Where are they coming? Where are they going? I don't want to disturb them. And, and so again, the study that I do out there, the watching just over and over will get me a chance to get the shot. And then you can get picky about your photography. Well, which way is the sun, you know, rising and, and, and uh, you know, and setting? Is there a wind thing that you have to think about? Time of day, I'd rather shoot in the morning or late in the day because the light is much prettier. Right now, if I was to go out and shoot in the light that's here, it's so harsh and it's tough to deal with. And if you shot at this time of day, you might get some haze distortion, especially when you use long lenses. 
that can be a real problem because that lens, that image that looks sharp in your viewfinder could be hazy, fuzzy when you get it home on your computer. Ouch, that hurts. Um, high speed flight photography, that is just practice. Just practice, practice, practice. Any kind of bird, I've been at airports and and watched them, planes coming and going and photographed them. And does I get, did I get the focus right? Does it work? Is, and I can play around with shutter speed. I can play around with f-stops. If you live near water, you can go to the beach and film seagulls. If you, obviously, if we have birds of prey nearby, then you can go out and try that. But again, practice, 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 have your camera ready to go, and then know those birds that you're photographing intimately, knowing just as much as you can about them. So again, anticipating behavior, flight photography, direction of light, the blue angels were flying over where nearby where I live, and you can see the Cooper's Hawk down on the right. It's a migration spot. Um, but I had the light behind me, so the jets looked good. I had enough f-stops. You can see I was at f-18. It was really bright. I could get away with using a, a small aperture, which increased my depth of field. I get the shutter speed, again, more light, and, um, and I get everything in focus. Shutter speed here, flight photography, direction of the light, um, all these, oops, all these things that I want to get, can I get the behavior where I anticipated the behavior? I knew the adult bird was going to come in with food sooner or later. I knew it was going to come with this. I tried to get the sun behind me. And did I have enough shutter speed, enough f-stop, those kind of things? There's your shot. Um, same thing, anticipate behavior, watched ospreys fishing. Golden Eagle decided it wanted to leave a pole where I was. I was ready to go. And boom, now my f-stop and shutter speed a little slow, but this is an older shot where I wasn't privily to the knowledge I have today. So I would have shot at a higher shutter speed, but luckily for me, I got it. Um, again, anticipating behavior, the eagles were feeding in the water here. Gotten a, oh, I knew which direction they came from because I watched them long enough. So I stood at that angle, had the sun behind me, got the shutter speed up, boom, I get the shot. Same thing here. The hawks always came in from left to right because the wind was blowing from my right. So I positioned myself on the right side. This is actually I shot with a remote camera, but I was ready to go, had it set up. And then just photography in general. You know, I use a rule of thirds a lot. Do you want the bird right in the middle or is it better off to the side? You know, does it tell a story? In my images, I always want them to tell a story. And in this, you can see how pretty this light is. It's right before sunset. So, you know, get this really pretty low contrasty light. For me, it's just the way to go. Um, Cooper's hawk sitting in the tree in my backyard hunting the quail. Again, rule of thirds, something I study as an art person, birds off, but soft light. You see how pretty that can be. And, and you get the whole bird in no harsh light, nothing to mask its eyes or anything, you know. Again, capturing behavior. Can I be in the right place at the right time? Wait, hope, pray, do all these things and hope that you capture something. Again, I knew my camera was going to work. I had all the settings and then you're just crossing your fingers and toes that everything works out. Same with this, you know, found the falcons. They were feeding and actually I've never seen this before where the female was feeding the male, which is crazy, but knew the behavior. Um, that they were gonna hunt that morning. So be in the right place at the right time and, and voila. So I do have a couple ethical thoughts. This is just for me and I don't do any of these things or do or do not, but I don't crowd birds or flush them to get them to fly, make them jump off a perch or out of a tree or you know, if I'm near a nest site by mistake or otherwise, you know, you don't want them attacking you. And, and a lot of people do, they, they will flush birds and do things. I don't climb into nests. I don't handle their young. I have worked with biologists and um, they do that kind of thing. And that has given me privy to, you know, sometimes getting some nice photographs, but it's not something I do. I don't use calls. I don't use live baiting. Um, again, it comes down to if, if you study birds long enough, you can anticipate their behavior. They'll come to you, or at least the, I use that term, but they'll at least come your direction. And that gives you a chance for the photo. 
And again, for me, can I be insignificant in the landscape? You can use blinds sometimes. Shade is probably the one of the best things you can do is sit in the shade. Or if you're in a vehicle, they don't seem to be as worried about you so much in a vehicle. Patience, I can't, I can't underestimate the patience factor. I mean, it goes off the charts and it's probably because I have a fishing background and I fish and try to catch fish and don't always get them. Expect the unexpected, yep, and have fun. That's the main thing we're all trying to do. And, and uh, remember that one good photo is success. It's, uh, I, can't under, I can't understate that. It's just, you only need one to go out there. You get more than one and you're, you know, then you're smiling even more. So anyway, that's my talk. I jammed it all in 15 minutes um, and we'll have questions afterwards, but uh, thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Nick. I, I think that, I mean, all the photos are beautiful, but the photo with the uh, Blue Angels and the Cooper's Hawk in the lower right, that's just, that was incredible. Um, and that was, you know, kind of, that was luck, but you know, luck plays a big part in this. So when you get it, it's just, it's just icing on the cake. I love it. Well, perfect. Well, we have sorted out our technical difficulties that we were having here this morning. And now we are joined by uh, Kate Davis, who is here with her Peregrine Sibley. So um, Kate Davis, if you are unaware of who she is, she's a falconer. She's an educator. She's a photographer. She's also the executive director of Raptors of the Rockies. Um, if you purchased a signed copy of Nick and Kate's book today, the proceeds um, from your donation are benefiting both Hawkwatch and Raptors of the Rockies. So thank you for your generosity there. Um, Kate and her birds have appeared in more than 1,700 programs for over 100,000 people. She's also presented her lively PowerPoint programs across the country from Boston to Seattle with Chicago, Salt Lake City, and Detroit in between. And she's the author of six books that weave together her passion for Raptors, science, and photography, including the book she's going to talk about today. So, Kate... It's great to have you here. Well, thank you. Um, I sure hope the, the, the mute button was on when we were having difficulty. It was, in fact. If you know what I mean. It yeah, was, okay. in fact. Well, I, I have Sibley here, and do I need to do anything? Do you need to screen? share your screen just as soon as you're ready to start your presentation? Okay. I'm going to put her... Oops. Share screen. Not good at this. Doing great. There. How's that? That's perfect. Thanks, Kate. Take it away. Okay. I'm going to put Sib down over here. Oh, that bird. She she is a, a treat, a treat to, to know and have in our program. Um, we have been doing Raptors of the Rockies programs for 33 years. We're in the Bitterroot Valley. So this is Western Montana. Uh, and there she is jumping off an irrigation wheel. Um, I've been into photography since I was very young. Uh, my dad was a photographer. We had a, a dark room in our basement and uh, did black and white um, developing and printing with him. And I always got his secondhand cameras. There's my, my Pentax, I believe. But he was very, very avid uh, photographer for a hobby. This is what I'm shooting. It's um, Nikon, all Nikon, just kind of keeping it in the family. It's actually a D810. That's an 80 to 400 zoom. I do like the zooms, Nick. And um, that has... A, that hangs on my falconry vest. So I always use a falconry vest in the field. The bulk of the weight is on the vest itself. And uh, all those pockets can hold all sorts of stuff. Uh, the way I got into this program and get it got into animals is I was a dinosaur freak and then uh, ended up being a junior zoologist. It's a club at the Cincinnati Zoo. Started when I was 13. Raccoons, foxes, squirrels, one skunk, and uh, screech owls and kestrels. As you can see, there I am. I'm carrying a basket of birds. The kids believe that, that I'm from the 1800s. 
Um, and then I, I went to the University of Montana, got out of Ohio, got a degree in four years. I was a, a taxidermist. And for 13 years, we were at a rental property. Then we moved here and built all these buildings. So those are the Bitterroot Mountains. There's our house and my uh, art studio to the left. And then we have 11 buildings out here. Um, at first, all these trees were planted by me. Um, it was kind of harsh and out in the open, but now at 20 years, they're totally comfortable, these birds. Um, the neighbors were thinking it was going to be a puppy mill or something. They had no idea what was going on. And this is, this is every day. This is every day, 365 days a year. And uh, our home and our birds. And so I do education, I don't do rehabilitation. And so these are birds that had some sort of injury or actually most of them are imprint birds like Simon, the one that's down in my camera gear. Um, the one in the middle is Jillian. Uh, she, I did a TED talk with her. And then up in the left corner there, that's Nigel. He's 25 years old, um, Golden Eagle. And then we have Ella Fitzgerald, West Montgomery, and Nina Simone. Wait, I see a pattern developing here. And then the falconry birds. And so we have them uh, here today. That was Sibley. She's 18 years old and has done 631 programs. Now, how do I know these numbers? Um, it's because I have to keep track of every program, the date, the time, the audience number, the miles I drive, the birds I take, because these birds are, are program birds and I have done 1,784 programs for 135, 899. So I'm going to add 70 or so to this, okay? Because that's what we're doing for this program today. Um, so every year I turn in my annual reports and they go to the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and to the state because these birds are all held under special permits. This is why we do it. And these are the kids. And this is a photo from the new book. Uh, Falcons in North America, second edition. And these are kids meeting Nigel the Golden Eagle stepping out of a kennel and uh, hopping on a glove. And I think this, this photograph is about maybe, I don't know, 15 years old or something. These kids are all grown. Um, and I always wanted to write books and I decided to do sort of a, a book about my kids program, Raptors of the Rockies. We have uh, Mountain Press Publishing here in Missoula, and I know the owners, and they, I hounded them, I caught them at our local ski area, rode the chairlift with them, I had 12 minutes to pitch my book, and they finally caved in, and I started around 2000, and they finally caved in and said, sure, we'll do this book, and this kid's book's been out of print for a long time, but um, came out in 2002. Then I was on a roll. I said, what's my favorite thing in the whole world? Falcons. And so I did a paper and I went to my very first Raptor conference and I presented my very first paper and Bakersfield. And this was in 2004, Raptor Research Foundation. The creme de la creme, These are, this is an international organization. Lo and behold, Nick Dunlop was there because it was in California. Rob Palmer came over from Colorado and I showed up from Montana and the three of us met. And uh, this is many years later, I, uh, after I sold some books, I finally bought a good lens. But I said, guys, let's do uh, a book about falcons. I was really nervous to ask them and they both immediately said, let's do it. So we started this book um, back around 2007. It took two years, it's about 2006 and it's falcons in North America. And the top picture, there's Sibley in about 2006, and below, there's Sibley in this room, perched on her perch over here, in 2012, or, or uh, excuse me, uh, 2010. Or what am I saying, 2021? <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, the same bird has given me all this inspiration. Um, so this book came out, uh, it took two years to write. I handed off chapters to all of the experts at the Raptor conferences, and it got great edits, and bang, stick it on Amazon. The first one of the first reviews is, geez, even if you don't read, there are over 200 beautiful color photos in the book. Geez, even if you don't read, 
And I pitched another book idea to Mountain Press and they said, Kate, let's do a big coffee table book. Let's do photographs with captions. And so this won the National Outdoor Book Award and it won the Montana Book Award Grand Prize. Nick, Rob and I, and I divided all, all of the birds into habitats because I, what I do is I pick up a book, I look right for the, go right for the falcons and that's what I read. This, the falcons are mixed all around in all these different habitats and there's 430 photos, Rob, Nick and myself, it, very proud. Um, then I rented a lens and uh, spent a couple months at a bald eagle nest that fledged four chicks and only 12 nests had ever done that at that time. Uh, then Rob and I got the brainstorm, let's talk about American kestrels. This was another mountain press book. And then this is the last one I did before this. It's Birds Are People Too. It's hilarious humor in the avian world. And for example, this top picture, there are these two swallows and she's saying to the other, hey, I'm out of paper on this side, do you mind? Uh, a lot of people don't get that. And then the lower one I put in for you Hawkwatch folks, it suddenly dawned on her. Oh no, I left the coffee pot on back in Alaska. Now, if you don't get this, you go to the back of the book and I explain it. <laughs> so, so this is my this is my attempt at humor. Then pandemic, and uh, this is my pandemic project. I had all these programs scheduled all over the place, and uh, I had one in Utah, even uh, a keynote in Utah, and all of a sudden everything was canceled. And I said, you know what, I need to redo that book from 2007, 2008, 13 years later, we have 13 years of science, let's redo this book. And I took a, a copy of the old book and I literally crossed out um, passages, I crossed out photos and started over. And so this was right when the shutdown, right when the lockdown started, when the pandemic uh, hit and we were trapped. Is I started this book every waking moment. And there's Sibley again, standing on her perch. So starting over again was pretty fun. Um, the, I put some new chapters in here for Falcon Tales. But this last, this last part here, I changed, uh, there's a Kestrel nest box and I added this. It's all uh, the dimensions, the size, how to build it, how to install it. And I added this, on several occasions, the author has observed bluebirds and swallow boxes installed directly below the kestrel box, not a good idea for the songbirds if that was the intention. Things you think are obvious. So I started at the beginning and here we go. Uh, why was it important to redo this book? Because falcons are now in their own order. And that's what the introduction in taxonomy talks about. They were grouped with this order of kites, hawks, osprey, and eagles. These were all grouped into one group. They split the falcons out in 2012 formally uh, because of various differences in morphology, physiology. Uh, for example, they, they're, they're parrots. They're like parrots. They have moved them up in classification they have, they're at the top of the class now, they're promoted from hawks into their own order of the most highly evolved birds, which are the songbirds and the parrots. And that's what they're more related to. So um, that was an, a very important reason to redo this book is to talk about morphology and physiology. Of course, the behavior and feeding sets them apart. Um, Nick, I cannot believe how many starlings are in this photo, but there are tens of thousands of starlings and right there, a, a peregrine falcon. And this is in the book. Um, we included a sidebar. So there's a whole discussion of how Nick uh, observes these, these amazing flights of falcons. He says you think he, they would go in and grab one with each foot, but these birds get away more often than not. Uh, I added my picture of a peregrine stooping on some dunlins over here. Um, nesting and breeding is really important. I love this picture, Nick's picture from the coast, the mom and the, and the, and the baby peregrines. This is a photo near my house. Um, falcon movements are, this is really an important bit of new info because of all the radio telemetry information that we have in the last 13 years. 
So this chapter includes migration, tactics and strategies, atmospheric conditions, preparation, hawk watching, a discussion of Hawk Watch International in there. And the last, the last thing I mentioned is Hawk Watching warning, it can be habit forming. So we talk about that uh, I, in the next chapter of uh, the, the Falcons and Humankind. Here's a peregrine that I raised a few years ago, every couple days. And this is Jake, little Jake. He's named after Big Jake, who's nine years old now. I think nine, ten, and uh, is my good friend here in Florence. Um, Falcons and Humankind. Uh, we talked about falcon gods and modern culture and history, falconry in the U.S. and how it's changed and uh, hybrids are so popular. Um, the GPS re uh, telemetry. So now people can watch the whole flight on their phone. I'm still way old fashioned. I'm using wires and, and the old fashioned way. But here's a picture of some peregrine or some falcons at a falconry meet that are socially distant. Then the current falcon threats chapter, that went, I went crazy with that one. Um, I really did because it's something that I wasn't really interested in, to be honest, and uh, I'm more into behavior. And uh, in this case, um, the current falcon threats, um, we, we talk about electrocutions, collisions, wind farms, solar power, habitat loss, pesticides, other contaminants, targeting of falcons, disease. Oh my God, Kate, this just keeps going on and on. And finally, climate change. And uh, that chapter is followed by a, the, the, the chapter called Looking Forward. It talks about education and, and getting, getting people to go outside. And that's what our Raptors of the Rockies program um, does, is we're, we're basically designed to get people to go out to go outside. And uh, we have the other chapters that are new for Falcon Tales. Hey, there are more peregrines now than ever before, ever before, uh, gone from extirpation or gone locally in, in North America to delisted in less than 30 years and didn't even go through any of the intermediate stages of threatened. They went from endangered uh, and extirpated to delisted. Jeer falcon is a, a bird that we're really watching closely, thanks to climate change. Uh, Aplomato falcon, there was a great um, push to reintroduce those. It did not work in my mind. I think they're just actually on the north end of their their um, their habit, their uh, range, their uh, range. And then American kestrels mysteriously are are completely there. Their, their numbers are dropping and, and have been for quite a while, especially in the East. Other places, they're just fine. So we talk about that. The book finishes up with species accounts. Kestrel, of course, and then we have the Merlins, um, Aplomato Falcon, and then Prairie Falcon, Peregrine Jeer Falcon. And they all have range maps, great discussions of, of different uh, braiding movements, um, I included this great picture that Nick has. Last summer we were in a in the uh, capital of Montana's, uh, Helena, Montana. We were in the, the, the city park in the center of town photographing these Merlins for two days. I think they were there three days. Nobody paid any attention. They did not know that there were these Merlins catching birds flying right through a park in, in a town. So it's pretty exciting. Um, there's over 260 photographs, 160 new images. And I put action images, but there are some beautiful portraits and they're all action because you know, they're, they're, they're falcons. So um, the year that I spent writing this book, I had 17 programs last year compared to 50 or 60. So we're, de we're donating a portion of the proceeds to Raptors of the Rockies education program. And you can contact me at raptors at montana.com. And uh, I just got a box of envelopes and we're ready to go. And I bought a bunch of books. So this book I'm very, 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 very proud of. And uh, it's kind of a, my proudest achievement of my life is this book. So 
I'm very happy. I, I love falcons. We all do. So the other thing I do, I do uh, etchings and uh, I weld birds out of steel. And Nick and I were talking about this yesterday, people stealing your artwork and making it, or stealing your photographs and making it into artwork. Well, this picture on the left, it's a composite. Um, I, I, think I, I think I drew that foot in. The cliff, this is, these are different cliffs. I just kind of took a bunch of photos and put them together. This is a photo of Sibley flying. I just tilted it up on one side. And then here's the artwork. So this is a, a, a dry point etching um, that I made of, of a falcon on a cliff. And I decided to get rid of the cliff in the background. Um, this is actually on plastic. And I run these. Uh, I have a, a studio here uh, above the garage. I can only do these etchings when it's not cold because the, the uh, ink actually freezes. But uh, this is my summertime project. And then there's Sibley flying. Um, tilted on one on one uh, primary feather, and I accidentally made two left wings when I made this bird. I don't know how that happened. I had to break break them all off and start over. Oh well. Nikki said I could I could talk about my favorite photo, and here it is. This is a bald eagle. Now looking down below, I love this Lightroom Classic. Um, for for photos you don't need to download every photo you take i get i i am really picky anymore but the bald eagle had this is a nest in our backyard this great big female bald eagle or two of them they left the nest at two o'clock okay so two in the afternoon i noticed they were out of the nest this is just right in my backyard in a tree nearby so I went down at four o'clock. So they've been out of the nest for two hours. And this eagle went to fly to another tree and a kestrel landed on her face. And that's uh, one of these lower shots. And I look in the back of the camera, it's all blurry. I go, oh, wow, I've never seen that before. And it's almost like they said, okay, Kate, one more time. Are you ready? Are you ready? And I'm shooting a 500 with a 1.4, so it's a 700 millimeter. I'm shooting 2,500 or 3,200 of a second. And the kestrel landed on her face for a billionth of a second, and I got this shot. So this is in the book. And uh, again, it's my favorite photo. And uh, theft. Somebody took one of my pen and ink drawings and put it on a billboard here in Montana, but it's for peace, make it happen. So we said, right on, and they left out the snake. So theft is a problem. There's one way to get rid of uh, any theft uh, from the internet is watermark, right in the dead center, cover the whole thing. <laughs> I've never done this, but uh, I know a lot of people that do, or just make it lighter, but you will find people are taking your, images using them you know for harmless you know for good just to make them happy is what we would like to think so there's a little powerpoint right there and a little discussion of the book thanks kate that was great and i'm so glad that you talked about that photo we did have lots of questions about it um so everyone a lot of people think it's some kind of photoshop but uh it that's a, that's a real that's a real one yeah so i'm not sure how to get back in here so i am do you have anything else to share just the bird just the bird okay just Perfect. the bird so how do i get back in let's there well there you are so okay Switch it back to you now, but you shouldn't be sharing anymore your screen. We'll see if this will work for us. Oh, shoot. I think it did. Okay, you're good. Okay. We can see you. All right, while All right. Kate is um, getting Sibley again, we will answer a few questions here. So we had a couple come in earlier. First, let's see. Yeah. Here's Sibley. So someone said, because raptors can blast across the sky, how quickly can you get your manual settings for the best shot? Do you set up a test sky shot without any birds? Nick. 
Uh, yeah, in fact, I'll just, you know, if you click to me, I'll just grab a camera and this is what I do when I go in the field. Um, and I'll just show you, you know, I'll look out the window with the camera. If you click on there. We can, at, your, we can, can see, see you. you. Okay. I got you full screen. Oh, so you I have can, full screen? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. So if I go out in the field and I go, okay, what's the lighting like? And I'm shooting birds in flight. It's a sunny day. I put it up against there and I go, okay, now this is a Sony camera I use. And usually on a sunny day against a blue sky, I'm going to open up, you know, I'm going to look and see what the meter thinks. Because if every camera's meter kind of looks at the world differently. They look at the bright sky and they'll squint a little bit. I know that I'm in manual. I don't want the camera to squint because more than likely um, the bird's going to be dark. It won't be as, you know, as I see it with my eyes. So my rule of thumb is point at the blue sky, open up one stop from what the meter says. So I'm up one stop. That means it'll expose, especially underneath the bird's wings, a raptor. So then I'm looking at, I go, okay, I got my, I know I'm going to have one stop open, but what's my shutter speed? Is it red tail hawks flying by or peregrine falcons? If they're red tails, I could probably go 1,600, 2,000, 2,500 of a second. So if I do that, okay, great. What's the lens aperture that I want to be at? What will the camera, because, you know, you want to get as much light in there as possible because then it lets you shoot at a higher shutter speed, but then you're fighting that ISO, which is, uh, could be noise. So I always try to keep the noise down, shutter speed up and have some f-stop. I mean, they always claim f8, you know, is the sweet spot in some lenses they are. So with this lens, which is a short zoom and it's, I think it's a five or four or five, six, to F8, I would probably set it at F8. I want 2,500 of a second, let's say. So to get that one stop off the blue sky, I'm gonna have to go up to ISO maybe 2,500. And that kind of hurts because that's a high ISO. The trade-off is, is the newer cameras will give you better ISO, high ISO performance, meaning less grain. Um, so, okay, I got my shutter speed right. I got the S-stop I like, the ISO, it's going to work. Um, and there was a question about what focus screen, what focus mode you use. And with the Sony, I use what they call wide, and it's a tracking mode. And, and here's the thing with these cameras, the older cameras, the, the point of focus is very small on the old cameras, meaning that it maybe just is the tiny little center will be what the camera focuses on. And if it goes off center, it goes out of focus. And you can adjust the cameras a little bit um, to maybe not react so quickly to the, you know, moving off center. But the newer cameras over the years have expanded that their sensors have got better and better. So instead of this small little area, now it might be the whole screen is is actually hot if you want to use that term to focus so even if the bird moves off that center or even a little bit you know it's still on focus and that is, is just absolutely phenomenal now the technology and that's kind of why i've moved to the sony cameras because their sony a9 was kind of revolutionary in that and now they've got the a92 and then the new a1 it just refined that autofocus better. Um, so again, I would use, I use a zoom lens a lot of the time. The quality is just exceptional, but I'll zoom out so I can see the whole scene. And then when I find a bird in the screen, then I can zoom in on it and get closer, you know, at least so it's less that I have to crop or deal with or I just bring the bird in closer. That's just phenomenal. Um, and that helps me because birds of prey, they move really fast sometimes. And you're like, where is it? Where is it? And I'll tell you with that lens, that's one thing. But then if you're holding a big thing like this, <laughs> you know, and you're trying to balance that and, you're, you know, and, and this, it, the, the area you're looking at is like a little peephole and you're trying <laughs> to find that bird. It can be really, really hard. And that's why I like the zoom as you play with that long lens, you have to practice it. That's why I say go and anything you can, anything that's flying, airplanes, seagulls, raptors, whatever you can find, practice, practice, practice. So when you lift that up, at least you're close. If you're using the big guy, again, the zoom lens, you can zoom in. So start wide and then zoom in. And I mean, with video, with stills, 
that's my uh, my the way I work it. Yeah, and you know what? Um, the first time I went to Nick's house, he got me doing something. He has that camera by his door, don't you? The oh, big, that's right. the big yeah. lens, the lens, the camera, standing up by the door on the floor, ready to go, set it at 2,500 or 3,200, ready to go. And that is what I do every time I come home. I put my camera somewhere that I can grab it at a split second and I have it at a high shutter speed because I know I'm going to need it. And living here on the river, these eagles that we have attract lots of other eagles. And they're here all the time. We have peregrines, goshawks, cooper sucks, sharpshins, everything uh, flying through this yard. And so this is right. Uh, I think that that birds are people too book. I think almost all the photos are right here. So it's just a, and especially Nick, where you are with the, the coast and the peregrines too. And, you know, it's just good to experiment, you know, and, you know, the thing great about digital is, um, you know, you're not really spending any money getting your slides developed or pictures. So just fire like crazy fire yeah. away yeah. and see, because the cameras work differently too. One camera is going to work different than another as far as how it sees, you know, light. And you may not have to give it as, you may not have to open up one whole stop against the sky. Maybe you only need three quarters or, you know, half. And, yeah. you know, granted, we can do so many magical things now in, in PowerPoint or not PowerPoint, but in Photoshop. But still, you want to get the image as close to, I mean, use the word perfect as possible because then you don't have to do much to it afterwards. Um, you, know, you could make a kestrel riding right on top of the face of a bald eagle, right in Photoshop, you right? You too can make Kate's photo. Um, <laughs> I'm loving this. Well, we have one more question I'd love to have. Kate, I think you might be a good one to have answer this. And then I need to steal you for the meet and greet for people who purchase tickets to that. So um, the question is, are there any thoughts on range modifications due to climate change? Um, and which regional species might wander far astray? Kate, do you have thoughts or Nick? Yes. Buy this book. <laughs> Buy this book. There's a whole chapter on that in this book about, about uh, regional changes, short stopping migrations, that type of thing. And um, it, yes, it's quite different. Um, Jeer falcons are, are the most affected because the, the Arctic is undergoing such uh, extreme temperature changes now, um, and so deer falcons are in trouble. Um, maybe they can adapt. Um, peregrines are the hardiest of all. They can they can survive anything, and uh, they're they're doing quite well. However, some of the birds breeding in the north, instead of a nice cold uh, spring, they're getting rain, and um, it's ruining lots of nesting opportunities there too. So um, it's very complicated and uh, it's hard to even keep on, keep on top. Like when I was writing this book, I was changing it to the last minute, some of the data that was being collected. So um, for me, I'm just happy to see these birds here, happy to see these birds. And uh, we have nests all up and down the valley where I live. And there's one site I tell people to go to. We just had a reporter here yesterday. It's a boat take-in site and peregrines don't care if there are people below them. You can have a party going 24 hours a day and these birds are still up there on the cliff just fine. What they don't like is when people are above them or like Nick has seen on the ledge or even in the nest. So we can be really passive and, and see some of the best behavior in the world with these peregrines and sitting in a lawn chair on the river in, with the scope or binoculars and uh, just watch them and, and they don't care. So I think that's that's my, that's what I, it, I invite people to join the world of raptors through peregrines at a cliff at a takeout site in Missoula, Montana. <laughs> I love it. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Perfect. Well, as a reminder, if you haven't seen it in the chat, I posted it a few times. Registration for the event is over now. But if you want to get a signed copy of the book, and we really, really recommend it, um, you can make a donation on our website today, hawkwatch.org slash support slash donation. Um, $50 will get you a signed copy and the proceeds benefit both Hawkwatch and Raptors of the Rockies. So 
Oh, Thank yeah. you. And also, act now and get a free bookmark. Bookmarks. <laughs> yeah. Oops, that's not one. Kate's giving bookmarks. everything away today. Perfect. Well, bookmarks. <laughs> thank you, Kate. Thank you, Nick, okay, for thanks. your time today. We really appreciate it. If you are joining us for the meet and greet, you should have received an email with the link to that. If you did not, email us really quickly at hwihawkwatch.org and we'll get you set up. Until next time, thanks again, everyone.